Morning, Pascal. Good morning. Thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, let's start with Brexit. There's only six months to go uh, until the UK's divorce, yet the talks are in deadlock. Is a deal looking likely despite these massive sticking points, uh, trade and the issue of the Irish border still, still really uh, causing problems? Well, depends of what deal are you talking about. There will be a deal between Europe and UK for the exit. The problem is whether this deal will pass the House of Commons in roughly in November, December, when it's there. So I have no doubt that there will be a deal between us and the British. Whether there will be a deal among the British, between the Remainers and the Brexiters, that would gather the necessary majority in the House of Commons is much more doubtful. And that's a situation which, uh, I mean, we, we have to look at that as it is. It's not anymore a negotiation between EU and UK. It's a negotiation within UK on how much do we exit economically. The whole point about Brexit is they want to exit politically. This is decided. How much of an economic exit will this be? In other words, and that's what I'm trying to explain to, to, to kids in schools, what is Brexit? Brexit is reinstalling a border where we had removed it. Now, the real question, and this is what Brexiters and Remainers are, are fighting about, is what is the thickness of that border? Mm. So a thick border is a real exit, but very costly. A thin border is much less costly, but may not look as a real exit. So how do you exit politically without exiting too much economically because it's costly? And you know, the notion that it's costly is obvious. The, the, the reasons why we removed the border, and the Brits at the time were the champions of removing the border and building this internal market, we removed it because it was more efficient. So reinstalling that is less efficient, hence costly. How much of this cost? That's the whole point. My own sense, for what it's worth, is that there will be a political deal. They will exit in March politically, and it will take some time before how much they to hammer exit out economically. Deal econo econ economic yeah. Economically is what I'm trying to say. Well, given the stalemate, there have been rumblings of a second Brexit referendum on the cards. What do you think is the likely likelihood of that happening? I don't know, because this, is, this really has to do purely with British domestic politics, uh, uh, the thinness of uh, Mrs May's majority in the House, mm. uh, the fact that the Labour Party uh, will want to topple the government, whatever is on the table. Uh, so this, this really is domestic politics. But, I mean, we on the continent, we have to respect the decision right. of the British. What we will not do and this is where there's nothing like a negotiation, is change the way we run the European Union because the UK decided to exit. Okay. Now, this is the red line. Up to them to decide how thick is the border, we will adjust. It's going to be costly for us also, as a, a small proportion of the cost for UK, but it's going to be costly. So for us, as thin as possible mm. is good. Provided, of course, we keep the internal market as it is with free circulation of goods, services, capital and people. Let's talk about the rise of populism across Europe. We've seen hardline uh, governments come to power in, in Italy and Hungary and close calls or perhaps historic gains elsewhere across the bloc. Do you see the EU continuing down this track? Well, I think, uh, I mean, if you, look at, if you look at the planet, populism is on the rise. Everywhere. Everywhere. Although I don't like that term too much because it's like if they were, they had the monopoly of representing the people. Let's leave that aside. Mm -hmm. We have populism in the US, we have populism in Philippines, we have populism in Russia, we have populism in Turkey, we have populism in Europe. Now, why is it so? My, the main reason behind that is that uh, the speed of change in terms of technology, in terms of openness, in terms of migration, is larger 
stronger than our cultural capacity to adjust to that, at least for part of the population. And I think there is behind this an, a, a sort of economic and social problem. Our economies have become more efficient, more open, more volatile. Uh, there'll be more winners and more losers. And in the meantime, social safety nets that had been built to take care of the losers have shrunk. So we have a serious social problem which creates anxiety uh, uh, and, and populists are surfing on that. There is on top of that a more complex cultural problem. Whether the solution to that is going back to the nations or keeping moving Europe forward, I have no doubt that there are routes to populism, but the way to address these routes is not back to nationalism. Mm. It's to reinforce the place of Europe in this planet and making sure that you know, in 20 or 30 years' time, we were not either Americans with their hyper-capitalism or Chinese with their state system. OK, Pascal Lamy, thank you once again for your time. That was Pascal Lamy, former Director General of the World Trade Organization.